Today we are talking about watercolor mistakes. We've all made them, I still make them, kind of a lot actually. Hey everyone, my name is Emily and here on my channel we do product reviews, art tutorials, and we discuss all things watercolor. So if that sounds good to you, hit that subscribe button right now. In this video, I'll show you 10 different mistakes that beginning watercolor artists often make and how to prevent or fix them. And be sure to watch until the end because mistake number 10 is a doozy, the biggest repeat offender, if you will, in the world of watercolor. Now, before we get into it, I want to emphasize again that we all make mistakes. Even pro watercolor artists who've been painting for a long time still make some of these mistakes. The biggest difference between beginners and pros when making mistakes is that inexperienced artists will freak out or even just just scrap it and then beat themselves up about it because they just don't know how to fix it. Whereas pros have made these mistakes so many times that they can stay calm and implement a solution to fix it. It's so helpful to have experienced professionals who can help with all the issues and emotions that go along with failures, mentors who can come up with solutions that work. So is something interfering with your happiness or preventing you from moving past mistakes? Maybe you don't have any mental health issues like depression or anxiety. Maybe you're just a human who lives in this world who's going through a hard time. And while art can be therapeutic, real life therapy can give you the tools to approach your life in a very different way. I've been to a therapist off and on for the past few years, especially while going through really tough life transitions and talking through my issues with her has helped me so much. That's why I'm really excited to tell you about today's sponsor, BetterHelp. BetterHelp's mission is to make therapy more affordable and more accessible. And this is an important mission because finding a therapist can be really hard, especially when you're living Limited to the choices in your area. BetterHelp is a platform that makes finding a therapist so much easier because it's online, it's remote, and by filling out a few questions, BetterHelp can match you to a professional therapist in as little as a few days. It's easy to sign up and get matched with a therapist. There's a link in my description. It's betterhelp.com slash art by Emily. Clicking that link not only helps support this channel, but it also gets you 10% off your first month of BetterHelp so you can connect with a therapist and see if it helps you. Now, because finding a therapist is a little like dating, if you don't really fit with that therapist, which is a common thing with therapy, you can easily switch to a different therapist for free without stressing about insurance, who's in your network, or anything like that. Speaking for myself, we artists, we can be really sensitive. We have big emotions, and we just need support and affirmation sometimes. So if you're struggling, consider online therapy with BetterHelp. Click the link in the description or visit betterhelp.com slash art by Emily. Thank you again, BetterHelp, for supporting my channel. All right, here we go. Mistake number one, wrong paper. If you've watched other videos here on YouTube all about watercolor mistakes, you've definitely heard this before, but it must be emphasized. Using the wrong paper can make you feel like a terrible artist because you might be doing everything else right. Using correct paint to water ratios, careful brush strokes, and good technique. But the paper, if it's cheap paper not made for watercolor, will fight against you, buckle and warp, easily peel or tear, and make your colors look dull. Here you can see I've used cheap printer paper for this bird painting. The water and paint bleed right through the paper and there's virtually no natural blending of colors on the paper. The second identical painting I did was on a slightly nicer quality drawing paper, a bit thicker than the printer paper, but still wood pulp based and not made for watercolor. The paper warps terribly and again blending is almost impossible. My last painting is done on Fabriano Artistico 140 pound cold pressed cotton watercolor paper. My water and paper spread beautifully across the absorbent cotton fibers, allowing for natural blending. Because the paper is strong and substantial, I can use techniques like wet on wet and even scrubbing or lifting without damaging the paper. Using the wrong paper is an easy mistake to fix. Paper is your most important supply, so do invest a little more in 100% cotton watercolor paper. You won't regret it. I like to use Arsh, Fabriano Artistico, Winsor & Newton, or Saunders Waterford cold pressed cotton watercolor paper. Quality paper is a delight to work with. You'll immediately notice a huge difference and you'll never want to use the wrong paper again. Mistake number two, using the wrong brush. While the quality of your brush is not quite as important as the quality of your paper, using the wrong size brush for your project can be disastrous. Here I started this eye painting with some washes of a light skin tone, but the brush I'm using is a teeny tiny script liner brush, much too small for laying down broad areas of color. I quickly got frustrated by how little paint this brush can hold and distribute. Because I'm spending so much time trying to mix up and apply enough paint, the washes are drying fast and beginning to look patchy. Now watch what happens when I switch to a larger size 12 round brush. I can lay down the color in three or four big strokes. 
the wash looks cleaner and smoother. Now using too big of a brush for small details like eyelashes can also spell disaster. Invest in two to three brushes in different sizes, perhaps a size four, eight, and 12 to start out with. I love silver black velvet round brushes. They're a perfect blend of synthetic and natural bristles. They hold plenty of paint and water, but are also stiff enough to keep a nice fine point, even with lots of use. Here's an example of a very cheap synthetic brush, just from a craft store. Notice how when I have a puddle of water in my painting here, the shiny cheap bristles are just not able to soak up the water. A good brush will be able to both soak up water and paint and also distribute it smoothly and effortlessly on the paper. Mistake number three, uneven washes. This problem is most often caused by the combination of not mixing enough paint and working too slowly. For this little manatee painting, I wanted to paint the water behind the animals a solid wash of turquoise. I mixed up some paint and started to work directly on the dry paper. You can see I quickly ran out of my mix and had to mix up some more. Trying to match the same consistency and value can be really difficult and that was all the time it took for my paint on my paper to start to dry. When I went back in to continue the wash where my new layer slightly touches the drier paint, a harsh line appears. My wash ends up looking very patchy and uneven. To fix this, definitely do not try to smooth it out while the paint is still damp. Let it dry completely. You can then take clean water and re-wet the entire wash. This simple act of re-wetting the paint actually reactivates it and allows the paint to soften and smooth out, giving it a more even look. Now when painting around objects like these manatees, you have to work slower, and this can be tricky if you're trying to create a seamless background. To help with this, you can use masking fluid or liquid frisket to protect the edges of those objects. This allows you to paint more freely and quickly around those little shapes, and it reduces the risk of weird lines forming. You can see on this little hummingbird painting, I applied masking fluid first, let it dry all the way, and then in just seconds, I applied a quick wash of blue, and it's perfectly even. Mistake number four, using too much water. It's called watercolor, right? We need to use buckets of water, not necessarily. Some watercolor artists work in a style that does utilize a lot of water, so take this advice with a grain of salt. I prefer painting in a slightly drier style. The use of lots of water can cause an unpredictability and lack of control that can easily sweep away your most well-intentioned brush strokes. Here, I've dolloped on the water, this greatly dilutes the paint I'm trying to put down and causes it to pool inside those water puddles. When my surface is this wet, I have almost no control over the paint. It will quite literally explode into the wet areas and it won't stop flowing until it finds a dry edge. Where the paper is wet, paint will flow. Instead of working with raised puddles of water on your paper, unless that's the technique you're trying to use, try spreading the water evenly across the paper to create a damp, glossy surface. Load up your brush with a creamy paint consistency, not a watery consistency. That will just introduce more water than you want. And then you can lay down paint with more control, but it will soften out and create gorgeous, vibrant blends on the paper. This is the wet on wet technique and I use it all the time. The key is to find the right balance of wet, but not too wet. Mistake number five, using too little water. When the brush is too dry, this can be almost as problematic as using too much water. If you find that the paint is skipping or skidding across the surface of the paper and your brush strokes are not smooth and clean, you probably just need more water on your brush. Instead of completely soaking your entire brush in the water jar, an easy solution is to merely dab the tip of the brush in the water. This will loosen the paint and get it flowing again without removing the color from your brush. You can also mix up a more watery mix of paint on your palette first. Now there are cases where you might want to use this dry brush technique intentionally. On this dog portrait, I used a dry brush technique, meaning a brush that is only slightly damp with paint to paint the scruffy dark bits of fur on the snout. It's a fantastic technique for short stubbly textures, one that I use all the time. Whatever you do though, make sure it's intentional. Mistake number six, going too dark too soon. This is a big problem for beginners, especially if you're still trying to get a solid grasp on how to adjust your light and dark values in watercolor. If you find that your colors look too dark, chances are you are pulling the paint directly from the palette rather than diluting it with water. The solution is to pre-mix your colors on a palette with a bit more water mixed in before applying them to your painting. I almost always swirl my paint in a bit of water on the palette so I can get an idea of how light it is before going into the painting. You can also paint it onto a test sheet of paper first to see how it will look on the paper. With watercolors, it's best to work light to dark, 
So start conservatively, mixing in plenty of water with your mixes. You can use tools like a value scale chart to help you see the light and middle values better. Taking a picture of your art and using an editing tool on your phone to desaturate it is also a helpful hack for seeing the values more clearly. Another technique I like to use initially is the wet on wet technique to help spread out my beginning washes more smoothly. When you start with your paper already wet, this can serve to further dilute the paint to ensure your initial colors are nice and light and not too dark. Mistake number seven, overworking. Overworking tends to happen as a result of poor planning in a section of the painting and then trying to fix it while the area is still damp. Not a good idea. Scrubbing and working your brush over and over an area will almost certainly ruin the painting. Watercolors look best when paint is applied with a light touch with minimal or no fussing. For me, overworking tends to happen most in areas in shadow where I've miscalculated the colors and values. To prevent overworking, paint light to dark, working in layers, letting each one dry in between. If you come across a section where you're unsure of the colors and values, like a shadow on a person's neck, for example, practice it several times on a scrap piece of paper. If you're working with high quality paper, overworked sections can sometimes be fixed. You must let the area dry completely before attempting to fix it. Once it is dry, you can then re-wet it, like you saw in the example with the turquoise wash, and use a brush to smooth out or lift paint from the areas that need to be redone. Letting areas dry completely before messing with them, especially as they approach the matte but still damp stage of drying, which I like to call the danger zone, will solve a myriad of overworking problems. Mistake number eight, bleeds. Bleeds happen when you're attempting to paint an area right next to another area that is still wet or damp with paint and the two wet edges touch. Here, I painted some skin tones around this eye. Now, without waiting at all, I switched to blue and started painting the iris of the eye. This immediately bled into the skin tones, allowing the blue to seep into areas I did not want it to go. Sometimes, bleeds, when done intentionally, can look so beautiful. But in this case, I should have let the skin tones dry completely before painting the blue iris. Mistake number nine, hard edges everywhere. Watercolor by its nature tends to want to form hard edges. When you lay down a brush stroke of wet paint on dry paper, it will dry that way, unless you soften the edges. The most interesting paintings, in my opinion, have a variety of soft and hard edges. Hard edges tend to draw attention or pop forward, and soft edges tend to recede. Hard edges in and of themselves are not a mistake, but a painting that contains only hard edges due to a lack of understanding on blending or how to do the wet and wet technique is something that should be avoided. To create soft edges, you can use the wet and wet technique. This technique takes advantage of watercolor's tendency to spread wherever the paper is wet in a way that creates gorgeous fades. But to do this correctly, you must extend your wet area well beyond where you intend to put down paint. This way, the paint can stretch out and reach a stopping point within the wet area. You can also blend an edge that is painted wet on dry by taking a clean, barely damp brush and swiping along that edge or scrubbing lightly to soften it. Mistake number 10, and this is the most common mistake in watercolor, being impatient. Being impatient is the number one problem for beginning watercolor artists. I was absolutely guilty of this when I first started painting and I still get impatient at times. Impatience is a doozy because it causes many of those other major problems we just talked about, like overworking, backwash, going too dark too soon, and bleeding areas. If I could give beginning watercolor artists one tip for starting out, it would be to let your washes dry bone dry, completely dry, before going back in and painting colors over or next to those areas. To help with this, you can keep a hair dryer or dedicated heat tool at your desk to speed up the drying time between layers. Keep in mind that some techniques require quick and skillful timing where you don't want to let your paper dry, like when you're painting wet into wet. And this just takes practice and a willingness to keep trying. The timing will be off the first few times. Watercolor is the only medium that relies so much on timing and you will make mistakes. But when you're first starting out, being more patient with the process will help prevent so many mistakes. Through trial and error and consistent practice, you will learn the timing of watercolor. Friends, I've touched on a lot of different watercolor techniques in this video, and I dive much deeper into these skills in my Watercolor Mastery membership. The membership is packed with hundreds of full-length narrated tutorials, including a comprehensive course just for beginners called 30 Days to Watercolor, as well as quick 20-minute tutorials called Daily Challenges that are released every weekday. They're super popular because it's a fun, no-stress way to practice your painting techniques 
like wet on wet, wet on dry, glazes and washes. I'll leave a link in the description below so you can check that out. What are some of your biggest watercolor struggles? Is there a mistake you're making over and over again? I'd love to hear about it. This video only mentioned 10 of the most common watercolor mistakes, but there are so many nuances to this wonderful medium. So if there are any mistakes I missed that you'd like me to talk about in another video, please let me know in the comments below. I'd love to hear from you. Thanks friends for watching. You're the best. Check out this next video all about blending with watercolors and I'll see you over there.